Hello and welcome to this episode of the Media Tech Podcast. My name is Matt. We have Eric and Wallace here. Wallace is a student in what class right now? Well, you're a student in a lot of classes. <laughs> yeah. You're taking like five classes right now, right? Right now, yep. So you're taking, not only are you taking film classes, but you're taking some core classes like psychology and English. Yep. I'm taking a psychology and English class right now. And then for your regular classes this semester, you're in the second semester for the associates program. So you're taking also... Um, your, the commercial production class where you make a 30, that's kind of what we're talking about a little bit, making a short form something, we call it commercial, but it's gotta be 30 seconds mm. or less. And then also um, you're in the visual foundation of visual effects with Lee, right? Uh, yes, yeah. I have the visual uh, effects class. Visual effects, and then you're in the uh, audio for film class yeah. this semester, so. Yeah. Sweet. That's a lot of classes. Yeah, there's, <laughs> yeah. there's a lot on my plate. <laughs> and Eric's been on the podcast before, but you are the head of the film program here Howdy. in Dallas, right? Yep. yep. Been here a little while helping uh, to form it and make it work and and, and make it fun. Awesome. So. And my name is Matt. I was a grad here from a little while ago, um, 2013 or and then 14. then you've gone on to do some amazing stuff with like Traxxas and all those things. And you what know. you're listening to right now. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so that's actually a good segue. Today we're going to talk about YouTube primarily. Um, okay. I want to talk about how, as a quote filmmaker, how your approach to YouTube might differ. Oh, and excuse the AC. We're in one of the classrooms it's right now. It's a podcast. It's social media. It doesn't matter. Yeah, man. no worries. <laughs> I'm not worried about it. It's real. And hopefully I do a good enough job removing that that you won't even be able to tell that you're hearing AC right now. But right. Um, so yeah, excuse the AC and the uh, uh, echo. We're in an active classroom right now. But um, anyway, so we're going to talk about YouTube, um, how a filmmaker's approach might differ from just someone off the street when it comes to creating short form content and the compromises that you might have to make uh, sure. with a formal education when you produce that kind of content. And then we're going to get into a question that um, that we get a lot that I'm sure a lot of different film schools get a lot is that if there's so much great tutorial content on YouTube for filmmaking, why go to film school now? Like, is, yeah. is it even relevant anymore? Right. Great Sh question. Short answer. Spoiler. Yes. But we'll get to that. Later. <laughs> uh, <laughs> or I'm biased but no but, but no I, I love to talk to people about that but um we'll save that one for a little yeah later, that's gonna I, get that's gonna get yeah. a little bit deep later but um so first off uh, my background um i've been in the field since graduating for like five and a half or six years now um and i have really found a niche in creating youtube content um and first off um you can learn a little bit more about my background on our first podcast with that we did the intro to film um which the link will be in the description. Uh, but I started working at an ad agency, which was great because we were, it was a real small agency here in Dallas and they were creating car dealership commercials that are primarily just 30 seconds for small markets. And the key there was rapid production. Right. Um, and it had to look good and sound good and everything. And our sort of niche was that it was higher quality than you might expect from a typical like, you know, Randy's Ford, come down and whatever. Right. Um, and so we kind of carved out a, a, a name for ourselves that way, uh, thanks mainly to our creative director but I got really used to fast paced production. And then I got hired at a local company called Traxxas, which is the leading manufacturer of RC cars and boats and trucks. Right. It's pretty cool. Um, and I grew into a position there to manage their uh, media in general, but they have a huge focus on YouTube. Um, and so we were creating at first weekly videos and at the height, three videos a week, all shot with a red camera. Like I think we were probably the only company in the world using a red camera with that rate of production right. potentially oh, yeah, absolutely and the the data size really killed us but yeah, I <laughs> yeah. We had uh, the same problem with the black magics when you shoot raw i mean it's like whoa and we, yeah we were shooting raw slow-mo 120 frames per second in 6k yeah at raw so yeah, yeah. it was it was rough <laughs> hey, here's the two terabyte and what are you gonna do for the afternoon exactly right <laughs> <laughs> um and so i want to talk about how like with me personally, I had the, I went here and I got the formal education of um, how to create like for lack of a better words, like cinema, right? right like right. with uh, lots of lights and expensive cameras and dollies and big crews and having to adapt that into a very rapid production, still maintaining high right. quality into YouTube. Um, so I wanted to first gauge um, your opinion on what you might need to sacrifice uh, going into creating such rapid production with formal education. Uh, so, what you might need to sacrifice. Explain that question a little more. Sure. So, like, so with me, uh, in my, my experience directly, it was a lack of crew. It was usually me oh, right, right. and one other guy worried about filming and then one guy to drive the RC car and that was it. Sure. And having to make it look really good, as yeah. good as you can on that. Um, and also really a lack of equipment because we would 
mainly be shooting surreptitiously in locations and trying to get in and out without getting noticed, which is hard with a red camera um, <laughs> right. and a car that goes 60 miles an hour. <laughs> right. um, and so, yeah, I wanted to kind of discuss how you might adapt with a formal education into going like the <laughs> modern social media. Yeah, absolutely. So first of all, full disclosure, I'm a huge fan of micro budget filmmaking. So micro budget filmmaking to me is, is something that, you know, obviously if you're making a movie that's under $50,000, some people say it's under a hundred thousand, some people go higher than that, but I'm a big fan of that. Primer being my favorite micro budget mm. movie of all time. If you haven't seen primer, try to see it. It's hard to find because so it's, uh, but it's an amazing film shot here in Dallas. Uh, Shane Carruth. And uh, that's an, uh, I love that idea of how can you make something amazing for no money? So I made a macro budget movie called Stick Men, uh, sold it to every blockbuster in the country when there were these things back when you were a little kid called Blockbuster, <laughs> where you would go and you physically get DVDs and, you know, made the movie for $8,000 and then maybe up to about 15 or 20 once you added all the costs for the things. And that's cool, right? You know, that's a feature thing. But the difference between that and, say, working on a YouTube thing, first of all, it's attention span and it's short. You definitely want short and attention span. And it's also quick and the amount of and being very relevant and current. And um, we were talking about the YouTube channel at the school, how I was adding videos to it slowly because I was doing a million other things. And Wallace uh, was looking up the school. Yeah. and, And you were like. Well, I was we, very impressed. Or wait, well, but when but I there first, was a problem you didn't like uh, at first. Was that when you looked at our YouTube channel, is that the YouTube channel uh, there weren't enough videos being posted yeah, regularly? There were there were old and for a film school you would expect like oh constant like constant, constant right. Mm-hmm. And so th- that's one thing is that when you're working on these shorter form YouTube things, you people want immediate. They want you know that. So that goes to your question of. You're, you're not making this giant Hollywood production with a big crew that's going to cost a million dollars or it's going to cost a lot of money or a lot of people's time. And how do you do that when you're just one or two people trying to make something and you're trying to get together a crew? We have that problem all the time with students trying to, to how can I gather a crew and I've got to make this um, smaller? The cool thing is there's so many tools out there for mm-hmm. making cool looking stuff on a smaller scale, right? I mean, what did... Um, what are some of the tools you've seen out there like that? Actually, that's a good question. This is kind of a throwaway answer, but I really like uh, Premiere's internal color grading a lot. Like right. I used to be a huge proponent of never use your editing software for color grading. Right. And ever since, or something. yeah, I would actually, I would use After Effects, which was this yeah. horrible turnaround process, but right. um, I would cut in Premiere and then it would take forever to export to whatever application I was going to use, whether it was Resolve or After Effects, whatever. Right. Color grade everything there, render all the clips back out and it just took forever. But then as soon as uh, someone on my team at Traxxas came to me and said, no, like you're being stupid. Why are right. you doing that? Like the, the tool Tools have gotten so good right. um, within Premiere and, and Final Cut has a similar um, and Resolve itself now is a fully featured editor. I had no right. idea about that until I went right. to NAB earlier this yeah. year. Yeah, everyone's saying go to DaVinci, go to DaVinci. It's not. It doesn't have everything that Premiere has. But it, will. it will. I'm going to say yeah, yeah. it will. I'm sure. But even the production equipment. So now you're talking about a smaller camera. Maybe it's a, a DSLR mode, or maybe it's one of those new Black Magics that just came out yes. that are pretty freaking yeah. awesome. I want one. You know, everybody <laughs> else. And then you just put that on a Ronin or something, right? And now all of a sudden you're gliding or DJ, whatever. You're you're gliding around, getting amazing shots um, with a one man band, kind of. Exactly. Actually, I'm glad you said that. So after this podcast, I'm going to shoot a tour of the school with uh, Eric here. And if you're watching this, instead of listening to it, the main wide camera is a GH5S and it's going to be on a Ronin that's behind uh, behind over there. Right. And that's going to be our whole thing. Like right. 10 years ago, it would have taken yeah. a lot more people to just walk or even just to do a simple video walking around the school showing Absolutely. it. Absolutely. Now, what I want to say about the bigger crew thing is um, you know, the world is changing as far as how you make money in this industry. It's always changing. But I don't want to shortchange people in their job and what they do for a living. Absolutely. So if you're doing this for a living and you're a script supervisor, then that big production thing, it, it, it's, a, it's set up. Hollywood's been making movies for 100 years and they've come to some processes that work if you're going to do a bigger production. And, and, and also it's got to be expensive because everybody's got to make a living, right? If, if I'm if I'm making a living, uh, you know, as a freelancer on Hollywood productions or big commercials or things like that, I'm only working on average at the most two to three days a week if I can get that much work. And to, to do the math on that, you've got to make 
you know, two, three, four, five hundred bucks a day for your time, sometimes more, just to to make fifty, sixty, seventy thousand dollars a year. So that model has to work that way for the bigger productions, and there are bigger budgets, you know, that are being stand, stood behind by bigger companies that have that money. Absolutely. But there's a lot of smaller companies or artists that that can't afford that, of course. Yeah. So now you got the smaller gear, you're making amazing stuff with it, a micro budget if you have a budget at all, and you're um and these tools help you create that. And something that looks more cinematic and more amazing, you know, very amazing. And you look at movies like Tangerine or um with a Steven Soderbergh one that was shot on an iPhone, uh, and you and you start to see, wow, there are lots of things that can be done on this lower end scale that sometimes look as good as the Hollywood right. stuff, right? I couldn't believe when I saw Tangerina that was yeah. shot on an iPhone five, I think, or six yeah. or something. Right. Um, but yeah, I mean, that's an excellent point. And there are some that are trying to bridge that gap between um, a very large budget with big crews and YouTube. Right. Neil Baumkamp is one that comes to mind. I don't yeah. know if you know, Oats. he has a channel. Yeah, Oats, that's it. He has a channel that, and a, that's a whole studio behind making these very large budget short films. I yeah. think short film, right? Are there any features uh, on that yet? No, but I think the whole plan was that whichever short film had the most buzz, he was oh. going to turn it into a feature. Cool, that's cool. I didn't know that's that. That's cool. Um, it seems like he has a following for sure, but I yeah. can't imagine that it's that at least by ad revenue alone that it's right. um, that it's paying for itself. Um, but on the other end of the spectrum, there's a channel called Corridor Digital that I'm a big fan of. Yeah. Um, right. And they are um, an, an, ex, an excellent example on how to create very high end looking stuff on a very low budget. I mean, it's still a high budget because they're a studio, right? There's like 10 people that work there and they're always investing, but like compared to what you might expect a very low budget. Um, but yeah, I mean, it, that is, that's its own thing. But at the same time, you'll most like very large YouTubers use setups that are similar to what we're seeing, like what we're shooting right. on now, which are very small. And that's a $200 lens on a $2,000 camera. I mean, right. that's nothing compared to, yeah, compared to Hollywood, like stuff. a red or whatever. Oh yeah. I mean, in the nineties, I would travel around with these beta cam cameras that cost $60,000 a year. Put, you don't want to check that when you go to the airport. You're thinking, oh no, it's going to disappear. <laughs> I have and, been there. <laughs> right. And when you're when you're when when your gear costs you know as much as a house, then you've got to charge, well, you know, uh, because you've got to pay for it. And it, it's not so gear costs have come down, and that's helped enabled this. The only thing I don't like is that gear costs come down. So some people think people costs should come down. You know, yep. when when it's on a commercial <laughs> level, and that's tough because obviously rents aren't any cheaper nowadays, and you know all that. So that's still got to happen. But but the reality is that it is it is very cool and a very cool world for uh, people coming into it now as far as the opportunities and the gear that's out there. It's 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 very amazing, really. What do you think the landscape's going to look like in like fifteen or twenty years? So this is the the tough question because um, I we also teach corporate work here because we're in Dallas and there's an immense amount of corporate work and and corporations they care about you getting what they want done quality and on time and, you know that's very important to them I mean, their message and what's on time and it you know look good and they're willing to pay for it to them it's 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 about you know i'm talking big corporations fortune 500 companies and so we also teach that world here at the school because that's a that's a world that you got to have your secret handshakes to get into and people need to know <laughs> that you know what you're doing and all that but then it's very important that you're not lax on it and you're not just, oh, I'll get to it next week. It's very important that you're treating it like a real job. So that world exists and that world's amazing and and can pay good rates. Um, it's not necessarily artistically fulfilling. Nah. <laughs> but, um, but to do artistically fulfilling stuff um, and not have those huge budgets, that's where all this micro budget kind of stuff's coming in, you know, all the cool tools. Um, I'm glad you mentioned Primer, and another one that comes to mind is Robert Rodriguez's first film, El Mariachi. Uh, yeah, El Mariachi. Um, which I always recommend watching that with the commentary track because it's like film school in a box. Yeah, absolutely, it's amazing. I completely agree with you. But one thing that sticks out, I believe Shane Carruth said it also, but Robert Rodriguez is huge on even today. It seems like he might be getting away from it a little bit, but he intentionally limits his budgets and his yeah. ev everything surrounding the process because he believes that limitations encourage creativity, and that's sort of like it breeds creativity. And I think that YouTube is an excellent practice yeah. for that, right? I mean, what can you do with a Ronin and a, and a small camera, you know? And it's funny you say that, because to me, I'd just as soon watch El Mariachi as a Alita Battle Angel. Yeah. To tell you the truth, they have provided just as much entertainment value to me, either one, and one was made for $7,000, and one was made for what, 70 million? 
or more. I think it was more than that. Yeah, and and so uh, you, you can't. It's, it's it's possible. Another filmmaker to look at on this stuff like this is the guy who made Brothers McMullen, uh, Ed Burns. Edward Burns is an actor. He got into this thing recently of making low budget things with DSLRs, and he'll hire actors, but. There's no trailers. They show up in their car. Their trailer's the bathroom at the restaurant they're shooting in. <laughs> they shoot in an active restaurant just like we're doing here, and they're doing it with DSLRs, and they're making these micro-budget movies. And if you got a name in there like him as an actor, then you can probably sell it and make make enough money on it. But that's a that's a fascinating thing to me to start looking at these pros that are also doing these micro-budget things, like you were saying uh, with uh, – with the, the site you were talking about earlier. So. Yeah, and I, that's a good segue into film, right? And I wanted to talk yeah. to Wallace because yeah. he had just done, uh, let's explain what, what your project was with, with So that. they just, uh, a few months ago, they announced a contest, a fight or an action scene contest where you have to create a 60 second fight scene or action scene. And they, you have to have, they give you a list of dialogue choices you can use. You have to do it all on your own. You have a certain amount of time to do it and go out and shoot it. So. Uh, I basically came up with this idea of a firefight. The idea that throughout throughout the video you ha- you feel this tension of someone about to get lit on fire. <laughs> so uh, last weekend, uh, me and a couple other uh, people who I've worked with before, um, what you were actually saying earlier about uh, Youth in the Rhone and everything, mm-hmm. we actually shot a music video for an artist from Virginia uh, a few months ago, and you can't tell that it looks it looks. We, we shot it for like maybe $800 and it looks like it was shot for oh, that's cool yeah uh, triple that yeah but it's it's really cool but our fight scene we decided to do a fight scene and we basically tied someone up to a chair um, Eric's son I think right yes yeah, my son yeah he's, he, he's, he helped with it he's in it yeah, you tie him to a chair, and you let, we're, we're, if you're give us permission, we'll probably show. Oh yeah, hundred you know, percent. Show yeah, yeah. That'd that'd be be great. It's only a minute long, right? Mm-hmm. So it was actually really cool. So I came up with a concept, and then again, like this low budget filmmaking, like y'all were talking about earlier, making stuff for YouTube. I felt like there's a lot more collaboration in it because everyone is putting their own time in. You don't have a full crew, so you can't have someone focusing on this or this or that. Like everyone is, everyone's the director, everyone's the producer, everyone is the stunt coordinator everyone yeah. everyone had their own ideas and passions into this project so it comes out this hodgepodge of everyone's idea and passion it's really fun it turned out really good too like it, yeah. it looks really good for sure i mean was that just a weekend project for you guys mm-hmm. or yeah it was mainly just like we were just i came up with the idea uh jordan uh eric's son actually came up with a a breakdown of it like a storyboard we went through we looked at it we kind of picked out what works, what doesn't work, what do we have the budget for? I think the budget for this whole thing was probably maybe 30 bucks. Wow, that's cool. Yeah. <laughs> we you had to get a knife, you had to get what, a gas yeah. can? As we, if, uh, we're, we're going through our garages trying to find what we can use. <laughs> we're just like, oh, God. That's right. awesome. go to the thrift store, thrift store right. find a chair we can break. Yeah. Well, what's exciting is, like Eric, you'll, you'll know more than anybody, like, what would that have taken to do 15 years ago? Oh my God. If you did this for, I'm always thinking about how if you did this for, let's just go to the corporate level. The corporate level, you know, uh, I did a Mission Impossible parody for a corporation. And, um, you know, we're talking, it was a low budget by their standards and it was close to five grand, you know, and, and it was very small. It, um, and, and it didn't even have the, the kind of action that this had in it, really. Um, it kind of did in places. But, it's one of those deals where when you go down that level of everything having a cost, then, you know, again, that's normal business and that's the way it should be. And if a corporation is paying for it and, and they want to do that, that is absolutely how it should be. Shouldn't be all free stuff. But when you're an artist or you're at the artist level, that's the problem with our business. People who are who are painters, they've just needed something to paint on, a canvas, yeah. I mean, a white sheet of paper that they get out of the photocopy machine, right? I mean, and some paints and some pencil to draw. That's not an expensive canvas but our canvas has always been expensive to, when i buy ours i mean filmmakers and um and now we're getting to those tools getting a lot cheaper you know spike lee was talking about it with the audio world when he made the movie bamboozled which was a shot on dv and he said that um, um uh, that uh you know where the audio world was oh you can you can have pro tools at home now or you can do it on logic or garage band you can do everything at home that you did in a big studio um, that now film's getting there. 
And he said that that was eight, eight to 10 years ago. And so we see this, um, you know, happening where the tools get cheaper. So as artists, we can, if we put in enough elbow grease and the time and uh, just like an artist would painting a painting, we're making art and we're doing it with these lo- lower cost tools. That even enable you more freedom almost than yeah. film cameras would before. Like, yeah. like the resolution, I, I think comparative resolution between film and, and modern cameras is about 4K. Is that right? I mean, yeah, it is. And roughly. the yeah. rumor is that the next Sony camera, the A7S Mark III, is going to have 6K video capture right. internal. Like that's giving you more latitude. I know that right. there's the whole debate between film and digital, sure. but that's giving you more latitude than you'd Well, with had. all that said, um, I think... Like y'all were saying earlier, film cheaper or film gear is getting cheaper and cheaper and cheaper. Like when we shot, when we, to get that music video to, for him, our pitch was low budget, great storytelling. Mm -hmm. Cause everyone can go out and get a camera. Everyone can go out and hit record and make a music video of some dude walking down the, walking down the street, rapping, boom, done. (laughs) So what we basically pitched it as low budget storytelling. So we focus more on the visuals and storytelling and not, what gear we're going to use, but what is, what are we going to film with it? Like, yeah, your creativity. Yeah. And I think that's what you're going to see more of. You're going to see more content, but you're going to see even greater storytelling content. Yeah. On the flip side though, do you think that maybe the ease of access is uh, enabling people to get into it that don't, that, that that clog the works? Yeah. Yeah. Well, it, it does happen. Um, this is getting a little towards our question of go to film school or not, which I definitely want to answer. Um, but uh, <laughs> but uh, yeah, so th- there is that idea of so many people out there doing it, and they're they're um, they're sort of um, maybe not doing as great of a job, but they pitch it for such a cheap price that people jump at it. And you know, that's an age old question. I mean, how what's your quality like? You know, um, eventually someone works with you and they they see that the quality is what they're coming after for you and they're going to hire you for that and they're not just going after price if someone's going after you for price alone i call it the craigslist level of making videos if everything for them is about price they're going to be your worst client of all time yeah because everything's a nickel and dime everything's the uh, you know looking at that and uh they want to line item everything they want every little little piece and it's going to be a miserable experience for you and i know we keep I keep bouncing back and forth between money and art and we're kind of doing that in this whole conversation. But I do think it's important that if you love doing this and you want to make a living at it, that there's a way to do that, you know? Um, Absolutely. And I'm getting away from your question a little. No worries. But even with that, um, we're saying between money and art, um, that music video, Jordan also with uh, the director on it and I with a producer and we kind of collaborated on the story and how we wanted it to come out. But we are not the ones paying for it. And so even as we were shooting, we're like, this makes more sense storytelling wise. But the artist was like, no, we're doing this. <laughs> I'm wearing no shoes for the entire time. <laughs> so it, it's, you but have to kind of like bite the bullet sometimes to get paid. Absolutely. Well, I mean, I'm, I'm sure, you know, you know, I'm sure Michelangelo was painting the ceiling and the Pope was over there. Shouldn't that be a little more blue? I mean, we're paying for you, this guy, you know? So, I mean, there's always artists and their, their, um, their benefactors or the, the people that pay for it is always, is always a, an age old question. But the fact that you can get these cheaper tools and you can do cheaper things in editing and allows you to make your art too. And the, the dream of course, is that your art becomes, you become an artist and people want what you do and, then you, you make a living that way. That, of course, is, is an awesome Absolutely. ultimate, you know, into that. And like, I think, uh, especially if you come into it as an artist, and we need to get to the film school question yeah. very soon, but um, I think that in my experience, at least, the biggest hurdle to overcome, which was right after graduating, was having to separate yourself from the work that you're making. Right. Because, like, there have been so many times with tons of different clients that I've had and really good clients, it always happens, like, yeah. sooner or later, that they'll make a, a call that you just completely artistically disagree with. Right. And you have to do it with a smile, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, but anyway, we have about 10 minutes or so left on on this podcast yeah. uh, we need to get to the question of now that we've discussed youtube um there's obviously tons of great content um tutorial content and, and it gets really granular like you could learn really detailed stuff about just about any program out there yeah. um and still to this day you can ask my wife um she gets kind of annoyed because she'll be watching like a really entertaining show or whatever and before i go to bed i'm watching 
what this new plugin in Premiere is all about right. that's seemingly super boring or whatever, but right. I nerd out about stuff like that. And, yeah. and with all of that content out there, what is the pro to going to a traditional school experience? So the school's gonna hate me for saying this. Please don't hate me for saying this, but I am not a super pressure guy when it comes to going to film school. I'm the head of a film school department. You would think all I'm gonna do here is talk about how much you gotta go, right? And I tell this to people all the time is, if you don't want to go to film school, don't go to film school, right? <laughs> yeah. I mean, uh, if you don't want to go, don't go. I'm not going to pressure you into it. There are some major benefits. You can look at something like, I say, let's look at Kevin Smith. Okay, so Kevin Smith was going to film school, you know, clerks, you know, that guy. And, he's, and he had a friend there that he met named Scott Mosier. And Scott finished film school, and he became his producer on his movies. But Kevin... Smith jumped out of film school because he took the rest of the money and he went and made Clerks. That's awesome. Yeah. Great. But Scott Mosier produced Clerks. Mm. Sorry, hit the, uh, <laughs> the thing. And Scott Mosier probably got some of that producing knowledge and some of that stuff of running something and running a film as a business and making sure that it worked from his film school. I think film school, to me, is the shortcut to get there from people who've done it before. And, it, and my advice is if you're gonna find a film school, make sure that the teachers have done it before. They're not just education only, that they've actually run a business, they've done producing or directing, or they've done things in the commercial world, or they've made a film, or they've done something like that. That's my big advice because you've got people that are there to give you those shortcuts. What's a C47? You know, how do you over <laughs> under something? What's a C stand? All these little shortcut things that you need that that'll get you into it faster as opposed to when you're overwhelmed by YouTube tutorials, you're sort of being your own teacher. You're telling yourself, I'm looking for this because I think I need to be taught that, but there's no one guiding you. And and so um, maybe you get it, maybe you don't. Certainly those, those little items do. I have a lot of students that come here and they come here because they're overwhelmed by YouTube because there's so much <laughs> stuff there. Yeah, that that it's almost like, where do I start? I can see a million things here every day, but where do I start? And there's a plan at most good film schools like ours, Media Tech Institute. There's a, <laughs> there's a plan in place that says we're going to start you here and get you there until when you get to the end. Now you've got this well-rounded thing. Um, and I think that's what a, a lot of people might need. And especially people that are getting into it for the first time and they've just decided, hey, this might be what I want to do for a living. But before that, they, they had never thought about being a filmmaker. I certainly think it's very valuable there. There are some people who maybe have been doing it their entire life, right? And they, they've they been making films since they were a kid. You know, I, I started making my Killer Jello movies when I was a kid. <laughs> and, uh, and you can see those on our YouTube channel. Um, uh, uh, but I started doing that. And and uh, there are people like that that maybe have been some self-educated. And, and more power to you. You know, do that. It's awesome. I just think that sometimes film school uh, for a lot of people is there's the plan, there's the guide, there's a goal in mind, and we're going to get there. And then we're, when we're out, not only that, we've got people there that are going to help you find those jobs. Yeah, I think that's a huge part of it. I mean, I think that the argument could certainly be made that the actual information, more or less, could be obtained by YouTube right. in a very unstructured way. Right. But then again, I don't think that there's many places where you'll find, like, what's this? Like, let's say that someone yeah. is very well educated via YouTube on the big concepts, right. right? But they go to a set for the first time as a grip and someone asks them for a C-47 or a Stinger, they're not going to know what that is, right. you know? And, and that's not to say that film school is only valuable for those basics, but right. I think that the biggest thing for me was learning to collaborate, mm -hmm. learning to get into the daily cycle of always having to produce something because right. you can't be lazy. Right. And then also the resources that I had following school because you were the first one you were the guy that got me my first job out of school and i would have never had that before. i don't remember that but yeah yeah no, it's, it's <laughs> and um I, I think that the the in addition to the education which will be much more structured and and more i don't know i don't want to say valuable but you'll 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 get it in a more valuable way when you're teaching yourself it's easy to be lazy about the things that you don't really want to do yeah i don't want to know budgeting <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to, to make a proposal with somebody. I don't want to know, you know, so it's real easy to be lazy about that stuff. But when you've got someone that's sort of holding your feet to the fire and saying, but you got to know this, or this is, I mean, if you don't know 
watts equals volts times amps, then you may blow a lot of circuits and <laughs> and, and, and all this stuff that we're going to sort of say, you kind of got to know that, you know, and, and we're going to hold your feet to the fire as a guide, as an instructor, as a as a teacher. And what I'm about to say is almost an anti-advertisement, but <laughs> I, I think like my business is built on rapid production. I like I'm hands on with every part of the process. It's basically just my wife and I doing everything. And we know YouTube really well and the algorithm and everything. But probably the single most important things thus far in my career that that I've learned is Codex. Right. And you, when you taught us that, were like, you guys are going to hate this, but you have to know it. Right. And everybody was like rolling their eyes. Like it was right. three days of learning what a codec is and all the different kinds of codecs. Right. And to this day, it's like, that's one of the most valuable yeah. things that I know I use on a everyday basis. And what's funny know? is Premiere is making it easier to not know codecs. You still have to. I know, but the, <laughs> it's making it easier. You just set up your sequence by dropping a piece on there. And so, you know, we tend to go a lot more that way and it sucks because um, it is important. It's a foundation of all video. I mean. But the minute you get a specific deliverable with a bunch of stupid, right. like random options yeah. in a codec that yeah. you have to deliver to some station that's running on 80s technology, right. you're gonna re you're regret not knowing it. Yeah. Well, yeah. <laughs> as a as an actual like film student right now, the way I see it is, I I, I came here for two like big re or I kind of found out why. Um, when I first started, I wanted to be a director and writer. That's what my mind was set on. Like I did, I went to YouTube and looked up how to write a script, how to do all this stuff. But when I got here my first week, I'm like, I don't want to be a writer or a director. I want to be a producer. <laughs> I want to be I want to be a set designer. I want to do So it, it also film school also helps you like lead into what you actually want to do. It helps you find the path that fits best for you. And also probably if I if I never came here, I would have never met so many talented people like um, like Jordan, for example, um, super talented guy. He knows way more than me, but being able to work on projects with him and be able to talk to him, he's able to get that information. And that's one of the big reasons I feel like film school, everyone should go to a film school is because you meet so many different people who are way better than you at one or like one or all things. And that collaboration aspect. And those, those are two excellent examples. I mean, you never know where Jordan's going to be in 10 years. You know, he might call you up and he might be working yeah. on the next Star Wars or whatever. And he'll be like, well, hey, hopefully he's moved out of my house. By then. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> Living under a bridge, maybe. No, uh, it's it, I think the collaboration is amazing. Yeah, that, that that's we even make we even have projects called the below the line hour project where you have to go work on somebody else's stuff below the line. Can you explain that? Yeah, really well, below the line is uh, on a on a. If you know, in Hollywood, below the line people are are people that have day rates that are not negotiated uh, above the line. It's like the oh, Tom Cruise is above the line because he's gonna <laughs> he's his agent's gonna negotiate his rate every movie, and those are the people that are like the producers and the director and the high end stars. But everyone else, the working crew, is usually below the line, and it's a it's a budgeting term that basically means if uh, you're more of a day rate kind of guy you're you're a crew member you do that and so for our below the line project they have to go work as a crew member go be a grip go be a pa go uh you know be a boom op be something like that on a, on another student's or a group of students thing and you you're forced to collaborate at that point which is great yeah and another thing that was mentioned is that i think is an excellent point is finding what you want to do you know like right. i came into film school with a very similar aspiration of wanting to be a director and, and all that and i still want to do that um you know later on in my career and hopefully i'm building towards that but i left school actually wanted to be a colorist like right. it's so different you know right. like i would have never experienced that world had i not gone to film school and it's still a huge part of what i do and one of my main passions about video production is color grading mm. um well i had a huge worry uh when we when this when i started here at the school i would always ask the question what do you want to do and and raising their hand as director almost everybody in the class right <laughs> and i thought how are we going to get to that final project where it's the class making one big movie where they're not all, all fighting to be director but i learned over time that no people learn along the way oh i've fallen in love with editing or i've fallen i really like doing things with my hands and i can really manipulate stuff and i i can figure things out technically so i'm gonna be a great super grip you know and people figure along the way things that they're good at and like to do that they didn't even know was really a 
a job thing, you know, what's a gaffer, what's this? And, and once they get into it, they realize there's a lot of options there. Yeah. You know. Absolutely. And another example, real quick, before we wrap up, is Kate. She's in Lee's class right now. Yeah. She was the July student of the month on the YouTube channel. I should go check her out a video. But she was telling me she wants to be a media manager. Like, that's so different, right? right. Like, she wants to pull cards and make sure everything's organized and all that. Like, she'd have never experienced that or even knew that was a job unless right. she came here. Right. Um, and, and realized that's where her passions might lie. Uh, yeah, absolutely. But, but yeah. So, I don't know if we answered the question of whether I should go to film school. I mean, it's, it's, it's in the deep in the heart of each person. I think you should explore it, go do some tours, see, see what you think, you know, about that. Um, uh, I look, look at a film school like ours and, and look at the job placement rate. Our job placement rate on the film here is unbelievable. We have many semesters. We'll have a hundred percent. Go ask that at, you know, no UT school, or North yeah. Texas or whatever. What's your job placement rate for a film? Because they're not really keeping track of it like a school like ours, which is forced to, be, um, which is great, which is what we want to do. But we're, we're accredited by the Texas Workforce Commission as well as the uh, ACCSC. And by having those accrediting bodies, they hold our feet to the fire. Much like I said, we're holding your feet to the fire as a, as a filmmaking student. They hold our feet to the fire and say, hey, you got to have 70% or better job placement. You got to have this. And by doing that, by 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 finding schools that are like that, that's going to help you as well in, in a totally different way where you don't feel like you're just drowning in a sea of I'm alone. Yeah, exactly. You know? and, and and one last point about media tech specifically is the amount of, and this also applies to every other program here, but the amount of hands-on experience you're going to get with equipment and gear that you wouldn't, that you'd have to work for years in the business to get yeah, to right. is stellar. You know? yeah. yeah, everybody gets to use, use, check out the gear. You can check out $20,000 of the gear and take it home, take it over the weekend. That's a little different than some colleges. Some colleges, like a teacher's got to go out with the gear or whatever. And we're just like, no, you should be able to check it out and go do your personal projects yeah. with it. And I'm able to get, for when I do do a gig, I'm able to get more money from myself that I can put in my pocket. Because right. like, yeah, gear usually, rental, like, yeah. I don't have to pay for that because I'm able to use such great gear here. I once had a student pay for his, his media to media tech uh, school on weddings. He wow, used our cool. gear to do weddings and paid for the school that way. That's genius. <laughs> yeah, so. <laughs> well, awesome. Well, that pretty much wraps it up. I'm sure that there'll be future podcasts where we go more into YouTube and more into the world of film school and why you should go to film school and all that. But sure. uh, to anyone listening, thank you so much for checking out the Media Tech Podcast. If you're watching this on YouTube, be sure to subscribe. In addition to the podcast, we're doing lots of different kind of content. We're doing what's called Graduate Dids, which is little mini docs about uh, graduates. They're doing awesome things out in the field. We're doing Student of the Months between here and uh, Houston. Uh, we're gonna, every month, we're gonna have a, a student that we feature on the channel and some of their work and such. Uh, and we're doing two minute tutorials called 120 seconds uh, based off of all the different programs here. Um, and come out and visit. We're in Dallas uh, and, Houston. and Houston and you can come by anytime. We're open. Well, we're open 9 a.m. to 2 a.m. seven days a week. So <laughs> students can all use their gear, but also you can do a tour and, and, and all that. And then what's the name of y'all's video you just did? Fire? Uh, firefight. Firefight. I will link it in the description yep. of this okay. podcast and if you're on YouTube. For me personally, you can. my Instagram is Jacob J.F. Wallace, W-A-L-L-A-C-E. My, my website, the exact same thing. So if, hit me up. <laughs> See that? We're already teaching him publicity. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Well, on that note, thank you guys so much. And uh, again, subscribe, and we'll see you again next week with another podcast. Thanks, man. Sweet. Thanks.